Coppersmith and others came in with comments on SciCrypt, calming the flurry, and everybody got happy again. It wasn't that big a deal. The attack did not work, as specified at that time. Variants are useful. But that makes you think a little bit. Let's go back and review the process again. Remember that session, the first 15 giving their talks and some dying and laying on the floor. Had the man who came up with the BES attack later on Rendall been in the room on that day and stood up and said, I have an attack. I have these huge array of linear equations, each term representing quadratics in the AES table, etc. And I can gel it all down and bang, I've got your variable, you're dead. I believe Rendall would have been dead, laying on the floor along with others, and would not have gone to the final five would not have emerged as the winner. And I do believe it was the most performance and widely acceptable and performing process in that pot. We would have lost a good thing. That's a process fault. Because of lack of time to verify further technical verification of claims made in a public session. All right? Just time to cool off a little bit. AES had the grace of being the winner and had time to cool later because it's too frightening to throw it away. So they finally beat down the BES attack and it survived. We have related key attacks being talked about now. Adi waved that. He didn't mention that it required related keys. And there's a real question where do you get those and can you make a start? But never mind. Um, but do a Gadagan experiment. We've taken him back and we could have had a dead Rendall. There's another twist to it as well. As well as having a possibly dead Rendall, the concern on the second part around see how do I have this phrase I wanted to be brief well that first one by itself I think is scary enough <laughs> but uh, go back to that first round again and look at the other candidates that were disqualified and are known to be dead do some of them deserve a resurrection was it possible they were shot with blanks the way AES almost was <clears throat> so there's another phase that could be examined on the process do they lie in their graves with respect or should they be resurrected Alrighty, uh, that's enough on the Rindal stuff, and I think so I will... what would be the implication for the Shafli competition? Ah, I was going to save my time and hit that later, but now, oh, nope, let's do that now. The Shah 3 is running. Thank you, Adi, I appreciate that very much. Um, making hash codes, in my mind, and I think most of us in the audience, is much harder than making a code book. Okay, we got, and that's another reason AES was a fun thing to do, because it's pretty easy, we should have a winner. I'm not convinced we're going to have a winner with the hash function uh, contest running. How do you make sure you do good processes to do that? They started with 50 some odd, 60 some odd candidates, they're down to 15 now. I believe the process is to run for a while looking at those and announce a winner. I think the field is too large still. I think they should pick three winners, not one, as semi-finalists, all right? and run another one or two years looking at those intensely to really make sure enough work has been done for a wise decision and not risk the hardy or foolish consequence of electing something too soon before enough study has been done. Adi likes lots of study, 13 years or more. He'll probably tell stories about that. We can't wait that long, but it needs more than the current length. I recommend extending the Shah process, picking three winners, not one, and studying longer before announcing a final winner. The current hash codes out there have problems, but they're far more robust now and will last longer for a process than the AES process. AES had to run fast because Des, Des was already dead, in fact, and should have been replaced many years before. Apologies for that. But we cannot make that mistake again. We have time in SHA-3 to do it more safely. Thank you, Adi. Okay, thank you. Just to add something to what Adi said, you come in every day and work on an impossible problem, and about every hundred days you have a good idea. Who but a fool would be excited on day 100 after days 1 through 99 produce nothing? I mean, because initially the, the, the problem you work on on day 100 looks no different from the others. And that's something that I, I really meant to add, that it's important to get excited about that 10th or 100th idea, uh, even though it's foolish to do it, or you have no chance of attacking it. If you say, oh, this looks like all the others, why, why, why try it? Then you'll never get anywhere. Okay. Well, I'd like to take advantage of the presence of our special guest here to ask some pointed questions. I'm sure the audience is burning to ask you all kinds of things, like uh, when it is that the NSA managed to break the RSA algorithm <laughs> and how that quantum computer in the basement is coming along, <laughs> and how to un uninstall the eavesdropping software in our iPhones, and so on and so forth. <laughs> but I, I'm going to refrain from those questions. Let me ask something a little tamer. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Mother is so pleased. <laughs> <laughs> so some years ago, it was certainly the case that the cryptologic know-how in the NSA uh, surpassed that in the academic community. 
To what extent do you feel that that's the same case? To what extent can you comment on whether that's the, the case today? It's a more nuanced posture. You have to take a look at the range of things NSA is interested in and the range of things the commercial sector is interested in. They do not uh, have an identical overlap. There's a fringe that we care about that you don't and a fringe that we care about that you don't. Uh, things we care about, nuclear command and control, I don't think you care and want to play in that area. Okay? Things that we don't care much about but that you are very interested in, there are some. And I really shouldn't mention it because NSA never confesses we're not interested in something cryptographic. But there are many terms that are not as thrilling for us. Uh, forgive me, I'll sin. Zero knowledge doesn't thrill me. I don't think it has. It's of more value in peer to peer mutual suspicion relationships among suspicious partners. Military systems are command and control top down. The general says, do it, shut up, go. You don't negotiate back and forth. So we have less interest in some areas. And you may be better off in those areas. That's fine, that's for your good. But let's take a look at the area where we both overlap and we both have something at stake. What's going on there? We cheat. We get to read what you publish and you love to publish. It gets you academic prestige and that promise. We do not publish what we study. Shame on us. Joking. You know, national security. <laughs> we have to maintain it. But it is an advantage and it's pragmatic. It's there. It's real. Plus, we have a very good budget, a very aggressive, very talented staff, hundreds of mathematicians, PhDs on staff, doing nothing but cryptology. That's a nice department. Most, most universities can't you know, afford that in their schools. So necessarily, I think, we're going to have some advantages here and there. Now, does it give us a better actual knowledge base, more stuff than you have? I think if you take a, the way to do it is not, that, that's, how, how are you going to compute that metric? So let's go through on various different specific fields, and I'm not going to do this in detail. But in each little piece that we might overlap on that are sort of different, people are doing re research papers and stuff, measure in each case who's ahead, plus and minus scores by some manner, and then do a weighted average over all of them and come out with that number to see who has the most ahead on average by defining an averaging function. I do believe the NSA is still ahead, but not by much. Small handful of years on average. Some dramatically so, others narrowly so, possibly even behind you in that pool. But on average, due to resource, intensity of mission, and focus, I am going to have the extreme hubris of being impolite and saying, I think we got the edge still. But I do believe that uh, in the 80s, it was a huge gap. And you guys picked all the cheap and low-lying fruit real quick and got grown up real fast. And it got closer and closer and tighter, sort of an exponential curve coming up. But I think we'll always be on a curve, slightly ramping, and we're very close together now, and both of us are moving slowly in a fairly mature field. So it can be a tighter race over the years, and we sort of fudge and nudge each other's shoulders and have fun with it. So it makes no sense for me to issue a, a vaguely differing opinion in this. I'm foolish, and I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> uh, first, I mean, as far as I can tell, I don't think nuclear command and control is a particularly good example of something that doesn't interest... Uh, the, public, uh, the public cryptographers. There have been some papers on that subject. Some of them, of course, from outside of NSA, but inside the government, uh, inspired by Gus Simmons, who genuinely was working on nuclear command and control. I don't think that's out of bounds. What is out of bounds, because is there are a whole range of problems that are inspired by doing real signals intelligence. And you really, this community can't do that. The minor point, almost irrelevant point, is that it you know, would be illegal, but generally for us to do it. A more significant barrier is that it's expensive, but the critical point is it really would be unboundedly frustrating to attempt to do signals, or real offensive work in public. If every time you're reading their traffic, you go publish a paper and rub their noses in it, they'll do something about it. Right? And so your work, because you, know, well, you think Adi's work is frustrating, uh, that's what they worry about down at Fort Meade. You know, we'll go blow some source, and then a bunch of people will have to work hard for several years to recover it. Right? And so that is the portion of the work. And when you're doing production cryptanalysis, you are never satisfied with the results. Right? You'd like to do it on the basis of less traffic, in the presence of higher noise, get the results out quicker, spend less on the computers. There are no end of practical issues. You have a product, that product is going off to your bosses who are effectively paying you for it, and you have to sharpen it up just as much as you possibly can. A brief 
Push back. I'm not.